This is the 88th message in a series on the person and work of Christ. And our message tonight is in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 15th chapter of Paul's 1 Corinthians epistle. Verse 1 reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. We're about to begin a series of messages within this series on the subject of the gospel, this gospel as it is revealed in the scriptures, the gospel as Paul preached it, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he was crucified for us, buried, and raised again, and all of it in fulfillment of, and in accordance with, the Old Testament scriptures. Tonight we're going to examine this testimony in the first portion of the 15th of 1 Corinthians. And if you had to entitle this message anything, or had to give it a subject, the subject would simply be how to be saved. Because Paul elaborates on his manner of preaching the gospel and the results that came from it. And this will be our message tonight. I'd like to call your attention first of all in verse 1, two words he uses to describe, or one word he uses to describe his preaching, the word preach. The word preached again in verse 2 and the word delivered in verse 3. Now he's been talking about an entirely different subject in chapter 14. He begins this chapter by saying, Now, brethren, or at this point, moreover, at this particular time in my letter, I am going to declare unto you the gospel. The word declare means to make fully known. It means to tell something and to give knowledge that is absolute about something. And Paul states that he is about to give the absolute knowledge of the gospel to these Corinthians. He reminds them that it is the same gospel that he preached to them when he first came to them. It is the same gospel they received, the same gospel that saved them, the same gospel he delivered to them, the same gospel he received, and the same gospel that had made them to stand. And if Paul lived today, he would be accused of being far too dogmatic. I was looking through some notes I have today on the substitutionary atonement, and I found these notes are filled with letters out of correspondence between myself and other persons. And without exception, this correspondence has ended time and time again with the correspondent writing to tell me that I was far too dogmatic on the subject of the gospel. I was just reviewing some letters today in which this brother, I assume he's my brother, said he didn't care to correspond with me anymore because it was obvious that my mind was made up on the gospel and no one was ever going to change it. And far from hurting my feelings, it blessed my soul that he had discerned in my letters that my mind was indeed made up on the subject of the gospel and no man can change it. Paul said, I'm about to deliver absolute knowledge. He didn't say, I'm about to tell you what I think. He didn't say, I'm about to tell you what I feel. 
He didn't say, I'm about to give you my understanding of it, or this is my version, or these are my views. I am about to declare. That word declare means I am about to set forth absolute knowledge on the subject of the gospel that I preach to you. Paul did not entertain any doubts about the gospel he preached. I don't entertain any doubts about the gospel I preach. I have never one time since learning this gospel in the Word of God said to myself, what if it's not so? If I did not have full assurance, complete confidence of soul, that the gospel I believe is the gospel of God's grace in Christ, how could it be said that I was a believer at all? This is absolute knowledge. And he says, this gospel that I preach is the same gospel I preached to you and I delivered to you, and the same gospel I myself received. Now, first of all, he uses the word preach twice. This is the beginning of a man's salvation. Someone must come and preach the gospel. The word preach means to evangelize. The word evangelize is not an English word. If you were to translate it into English, it would go something like this, announce the good news. Paul said when he came with his absolute knowledge of the gospel to Corinth, he announced good news to the Corinthians. This is the beginning of a man's salvation. Somebody announces to him the good news of the gospel. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, if you just want to turn there for a moment, you don't need to. But in the 13th verse, Paul says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then he reasons thus, and he raises four questions of tremendous importance. The first one, let me just paraphrase it, put it in our uh, vernacular, our common ordinary language. Listen, here is Paul's argument. If he were sitting in your living room talking and you were saying to him, now Paul, tell us, you've told us now that Christ died for us, you've told us that he was delivered for our sins, for our offenses, and raised for our justification. You've told us that if a man would believe in his heart and confess with his mouth that Jesus was raised from the dead, he'd be saved. Now tell us one more time, what must I do to be saved? And this is the way Paul would say it. Why, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus, upon his authority, upon his merit, shall call upon him means to trust in him, to cast himself upon him. He shall be saved. And then, as though Paul is reasoning with himself, thinking about the unevangelized, he says this, But how could a man call on the Lord if he hasn't believed in him? You see, you believe in your heart unto righteousness. Then you call upon the name of the Lord. How could a man call on the Lord if he didn't believe in him? And then he goes a step further and he says, well, how could he believe in him if he's never heard about him? He couldn't. Then he says, well, how is he going to hear about him without a preacher? And then he says, there's another question even beyond that. How can a man preach except he be sent? I would to God the ministry learned the truth of that. And then he goes on to say, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And I love this verse, but I'm sorry to tell you it doesn't have anything to do with the beauty of a preacher's feet. The word beautiful does not mean beautiful as we use it. My, your feet are beautiful. My feet aren't beautiful. I never did see any feet that were beautiful. Did you? They're funny looking things. Toes all over the ends of them. <laughs> stuff like that. The word beautiful means timely, strategic. And there's more in this passage, brethren, than we'll ever discern this side of glory. That when a man is sent of God to preach the good news to a sinner, that he might hear 
and believe and call upon the name of the Lord, he comes at a strategic time in that man's life. Do you know that? He comes at a specific time, a timely moment. We're back to our divine appointments. He can't come a moment too soon. He can't come a moment too late. He must appear in that man's life in a time when his heart has been opened and prepared and turned and made ready to receive the good news of the gospel of Christ. That's the reason why those who preach the gospel, I'm not talking about professional preaching, I'm talking about believers who are sent out to announce the good news to sinners, they must be sent. They must be led of the Holy Spirit. They must go in God's time and they must give God's good news. And every preacher who preaches because he's sent finds out when he has delivered his message that he has indeed announced good news to a sinner. One thing to give a man the message of the gospel and it's no good news to him. It's something else to have the blessing of realizing that you've given him good news and you've appeared at a strategic moment in his life. Paul said, I came to you and I preached. I announced the good news because a man can't get saved until the good news is announced. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How does the Word of God come? The Word of God comes by a preacher. How does the preacher come? He is sent. Please let me elaborate for a moment on the term preacher. The only thing we have conveyed to our senses by the word preacher is the professional clergy. All Christians are preachers. You were born preachers. That's the only kind of women preachers I believe in. All women, all men, all boys and all girls who are saved by the grace of God are preachers. They are sent. Christ has committed to us the gospel and the ministry of reconciliation, has he not? Our business is to be available to him to announce that good news at a strategic time in the life of some poor sinner who would call on the name of the Lord if he had only heard that he might believe. There are some, few indeed, but some, to whose ears and hearts the message of the gospel would be good news. I'm talking about believers, but I'm talking about preachers. Paul came to Corinth and he announced to these pagans, these Gentiles, these heathens, the good news. And the first qualification for preaching is simply this. Make sure that what you preach is good news. He came bearing good news and he said he delivered it to them. And the word delivered is a judicial term which means to surrender or to yield up what has been entrusted to one. Now let me elaborate again on Paul's preaching. He preached good news as one who was surrendering up Delivering over or yielding up what had been entrusted to his care. This is the impetus and the motive behind our witnessing, our giving of the gospel to the unsaved. It has been committed to us. It has been entrusted to us. It has been deposited in us. And we owe it to the unsaved. Paul said in Romans 1, I am a debtor. What did he mean by that? He said, I was under a moral obligation. I was indebted to the barbarians and to the Greeks. I am indebted to the Gentiles and to the Jews. Paul felt upon his heart from Christ an indebtedness to all who were outside of Jesus. And in this indebtedness, he delivered up. He delivered his soul. He got off this conscience, that moral obligation that he owed to the unsaved. He owed no debt to Christ, for we are not indebted to God. God has saved us by grace. We owe him no debt, else grace is no longer grace. Our debt is to the unsaved, and we have something that we can give him, something we can deliver up, and we owe it to him for Jesus' sake. 
This is what we feel, if you'll pardon me for using such a vague word. This is what we feel at times when in the presence of a soul that we discern is hungry, a soul we discern groping for some light and some knowledge of the Lord, a soul that we discern that perhaps would call upon the name of the Lord if only he had heard of him and could believe in him. And so we are morally obligated. We feel something within that enables us to give to him, deliver up to him, yield and surrender up to him what has been entrusted to us, the glorious and golden treasure of the gospel committed to these earthen vessels. I think Paul must have had this in mind when he said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Why a man would bust at the sea if he got in the presence of a sinner. That he discerned by the Holy Spirit had had a prepared heart like the eunuch in that chair, longing to know this Lord that he might call upon him. Why he'd bust at the sea if he didn't open his heart and his mouth and declare unto him like Philip did, Jesus. Paul went to Corinth and he would have exploded if he couldn't have delivered to those Corinthians the gospel he knew and loved, the gospel that saved his soul. So when a man gets saved, it begins with a preacher who has good news to announce, who is indebted, who is indebted to those who are without Christ. And also the last facet of Paul's preaching was this. He says it was the same gospel that he himself had received. Now, I like this. The man isn't qualified to preach. He isn't fit to preach anything to anybody until he himself has, from personal experience, received that gospel he preaches. The word receive means to have an intimate and personal fellowship, to associate oneself intimately and personally. And Paul had intimately and personally been associated with the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. He too had received, had associated himself with Christ in an intimate and personal relationship. And out of that personal relationship with Christ came his preaching and his desire to deliver up the gospel that had been committed to his trust. This is where the beginning of a man's salvation is. It is in the yielded and given over life of another who has himself been saved by the same gospel creation. Of course, the trouble with professional preachers today is simply the fact that we have so many preaching who themselves know not the gospel and who themselves have never received the gospel the reason they do not have good news to announce. They preach their theology, they preach their religion, they preach their understanding, their ideas, their views, their theories. But it takes a man who knows Jesus to preach Jesus. Paul knew it. Paul had been intimately and personally associated with him. Paul had seen him. Paul had talked with him. Paul had spent precious hours in his presence. We cannot have that privilege of seeing him face to face. Yes, we do not have that joy of sitting at his feet as Paul did. Yes, but we have his word, and the word is Christ, and Christ is the word. And those who come to know and love the Lord Jesus soon know what Paul knew, that we have something we must deliver to others, and it is good news. And oh, how I wish that the unsaved could discern this motive in us. Do you know that us, who, we who know and love the Lord Jesus, are so stupid as to think, <laughs> this is using the world's explanation for it, we do really believe that what we have to give sinners is good news. That's the reason for our boldness. That's the reason why we are abrupt. That's the reason why we sometimes appear to be a little obnoxious. That's the reason why we're so anxious, so overbearing, as the world likes to describe us. We can help ourselves. We honestly believe that we have good news to tell. And we just have to tell it from time to time. This is how men get saved, too. 
And you know, if you really got good news, <laughs> you can't hardly keep it. <laughs> He's just about busted the same as trying to keep it. I told Lena tonight before I got in, I said, no use me going in there without giving away. <laughs> I said, why? I said, I'll be grinning from ear to ear as soon as I hit the door. <laughs> and they know I don't grin like it all the time. You can't keep good news very long. You've got to tell somebody. That's the joy of knowing good news, isn't it? Paul had good news. He couldn't keep it. He just roamed around the Roman Empire looking for somebody to tell it to. Every now and then he found somebody. Let me tell you, he had something to tell him when he did. He found some people in court started with a little man who knew Jesus himself. He felt that Christ had entrusted to his care that precious gospel. He felt like it was good news for the sinner. Now, do you know why the believer who tells others about Jesus, do you know why he believes it to be good news? Because it was good news to him when he heard it. We were looking through some old snapshots uh, today. And uh, there was a picture of me sitting on the front steps of my house about, oh, just a few months before the Lord saved me. And I said to Lena, I said, there's a perfect portrait, a perfect picture of an unsaved man. You can see it in my face. You can see it in every bone of my body. Just a man without Christ. I didn't look sad, but you could see it all over me. A man with nothing in his heart. Nothing just sitting there in the world without God and without hope, without help. And let me tell you, it was good news. When I heard that the Lord Jesus Christ died for me, when I heard that God loved me, that Christ was buried for me, and that he was raised from the dead as the guarantee and the assurance and the proof that my salvation was affected by his work. It was good news to me. And when I heard that good news with my heart, received it with my heart, it was hard to keep. It was hard to keep. I had to tell it to others. And I have to tell it again tonight. And I'll have to tell it as long as I live and as long as Jesus does not come. Believers will have to tell it. And if we seem a little overbearing, if we seem a little repetitious, if we seem a little tiring, it is only because we sincerely believe that what we preach is good news and we sincerely believe that someone sometime will hear it, recognize it as good news, believe it, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Quite a difference between that and just a humdrum, ho-hum repetition of theology. We're not just passing on, well, this is what we're supposed to believe, brethren. We're preaching something, Paul says, we ourselves have received. Know it to be good news, and must be delivered up unto you. This is where a man's salvation begins. Someone in love with Jesus, telling good news to others, because he must, for Christ's sake, deliver what he has to the unsaved. And then what happens when the gospel is preached? Listen to what happened in Corinth. Number one, they received it. Now, it's not quite, yes it is, it is in that order. In verse one, which also ye have received. The word receive means to associate yourself in an intimate and personal fellowship. These Corinthians, when they heard Paul's gospel, associated themselves intimately with the Lord Jesus. They received that gospel. It means that they could relate themselves to the Christ Paul preached. Now, if you know what that means, I'll try and explain it to you. They heard the gospel. To the unbeliever, it is just a repetition of fact. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried and raised again the third day, according to the Scriptures. But to a believer, it is good news. He hears it, and he says, this is intimate and this is personal. It was that Christ died for me. It was my sins that crucified him. He was buried for me. I was raised with him, and he was raised for me. He associates himself in an intimate and personal manner 
with that ghastly hair. I'll give you a little illustration. You can be sitting in an airport terminal or a bus station or a train terminal waiting for someone you love. The trains are called out by the dispatcher or the plane. Flight number 210 landing on runway 3. And it means nothing to you. It's only facts and the repetition of facts. So there's an airplane landing. What is that to me? It's something to somebody. Look at the faces of those people out there. But it's nothing to me. But they call that one. I'm waiting to hear that one plane. And when I hear that call, I am intimately and personally related to that plane. There is something in that plane that belongs to me. There is something there that affects me, something that ties my heart with that. It's good news when I hear it. Although I may have set through 15 announcements, this time I hear this announcement, it is good news. For there is something personal and something intimate between myself and what I've heard. Now, this is what happened to the Corinthians. They had heard the philosophers, they had heard the peddlers of religion, they had listened to the Judaizers, but his little man came up into court and preached. And let me tell you, when they heard what he had to say, there was an intimate and personal relationship between themselves and that gospel. Christ died for me, that Corinthian said when he heard it. It was my sins he bore at the cross. He took my place. He's my Savior, my Redeemer. My Lord, my God, as Thomas said. And Paul said, this is what you did when I announced the good news. You received it. That word is explained in our text here tonight by believing. For he speaks of them believing. He warns them. He wonders that some have believed in vain. But the reverse of that statement is true. To receive the gospel is to believe the gospel. Looking up the word believe, in case you didn't know what it means, it means to have faith in a person, or it means to commit to a person, or it means to entrust to a person. And when Paul preached the gospel, and when anybody preaches it, if anybody gets saved, it is because they relate in an intimate and personal manner to that gospel when they hear it. And they believe. They trust in that person who is the subject of the gospel, Jesus Christ. They commit to that person who is the object of the gospel. They trust to him their everlasting, immortal soul's keeping. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And that's the whole story of faith. And Paul said, when you heard the gospel, when the good news was announced, when I delivered to you what was on my soul, out of my own experiences with Christ, you were able to see a personal connection between yourself and the gospel, and you believed in Christ. You trusted yourself to him. You committed your soul to him. And he says, and you were saved by that God. It's an easy way to be saved, isn't it? All right. First, before we go on to that, he warns them about believing in vain. It'll be explained in a moment. Is it possible for a man to believe and not believe in a true and saving way, yes. Very definitely. In vain means without effect, empty, useless, meaningless, profitless. How can a man believe and it have no effect? That's a good question. Men say they believe. It's possible to have a historic head faith in the gospel. It's possible to sit and hear the gospel and it's never really good news to you. And I can't pound this too much. It's so simple that it gets complicated in a little while. 
Let me expound this one more time to you. The gospel, if it is received with saving faith, is good news. I hammer on this point, for it's the heart of the message. If it's not good news to you, it's because you've never believed it. Therefore you can believe in vain, for to believe in vain is to believe without effect. And I want to tell you something. I had a fresh dose of it tonight. Good news affection. You just don't have any idea what the most reserved person is liable to say upon hearing good news. He may just jump right up and bang his head against the ceiling. Here's good news, right? Good news affects you, doesn't it? Bad news affects you. And good news affects you too, especially when you've waited so long to hear it. It bursts on you like the rising of the sun. Why, it's enough to make a man explode. What about a poor sinner who's waited all his life to hear it? Waited every day, every day, every day for some good news and heard nothing. What about a poor sinner who went through a thousand sleepless nights waiting to hear some good news and never heard it? I say to you that when he hears the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and believes it, it's got to affect him because it's good news. Now, I didn't know anything about theology when the Lord saved me. didn't know anything about the Bible. didn't know anything about religion. And I knew about what I'm talking about right now. Because I want to tell you, when I was saved, when the gospel became good news to my soul, it affected me. I'll tell you how it affected me. I went to bed in a manner I never went to bed before in my life. I had a heart so light it could have floated away on a summer breeze. I didn't know all that had happened to me. I didn't have the slightest idea of the mechanics of what had happened to me. I'm not even sure that I could have said, I'm saved, and I know I'm saved. I didn't even know terms like that. All I knew was, and I kept saying it over and over for several hours after I got out of my bed, I couldn't sleep for the joy that I knew in my heart. I just kept saying over and over to myself, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. I'd been affected because I'd heard some good news that night. What I heard with my heart that night was that God loved me and Christ died for me and I could be saved by simply receiving which I'd done. In the best way I knew how, in the little knowledge I had, the little faith that I had, I claimed Jesus for my Savior then and there. And something happened in my heart. The burden of the guilt and the penalty of my sin rolled away. My heart was no longer heavy. There was no burden of sin and its guilt upon my soul. My conscience had been purged by the blood of Christ. I didn't know all of that, nor could I have said it in language like that. But I knew one thing, I had heard the best news I had ever heard in my life, and it affected me. And I want to tell you, if you believed in vain, unless the good news affects you. I've been preaching the gospel for 19 years. I'm going on the 20th year of my gospel <coughs> ministry. And you people who have watched me preach, some of you, for 15 years, you know without me trying to prove to you that the gospel is still good news to me when I preach it. Still good news. I still relate in an intimate and personal manner to it when I preach it. It is still something I feel I must deliver, whether men hear it, whether they believe it, that's one matter. But I must relate it, and I must tell it, and I must announce it, and I must deliver it, and so must you who know the Lord. Paul said you received it, you believed it, and you were saved by it. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This gospel, Paul said, is the power of God and the salvation, and it, the gospel itself, was the power of God and the salvation of the Corinthian soul. The power of God to save a man's soul is resident in the gospel itself. The work has been finished. Nothing has to be done to save a man. 
The work is all finished. Jesus has died 1900 years ago, shed his precious blood and carried it to the mercy seat in heaven, and God accepted it as many years ago. He has been raised from the dead and seated there for 19 centuries as the proof of a finished work for sinners. There's nothing to be done in order to be saved. There's nothing that can be done. The power of the gospel, the power of salvation, is in the announcement of what has already been done. When men hear that announcement and believe it, the whole power of that work, the whole effectiveness of that blood, the whole scope of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection becomes effective in that believer's soul. And he is saved by a work that's already finished, but announced through the good news. They were saved by grace, through faith, in the gospel. Now, how can a man know whether he has really believed in the good news of God or whether he has believed in vain? Isn't that a good question? I keep telling you this, not to scare you, because the psalm facts. The people in hell do not expect to be there. They do not expect to go there. In that great day, they shall stand, Jesus said, before him, and they will still be absolutely shocked when they are told that they are not in heaven. When he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you, they're going to be shocked. For they are going to be saying, Lord, Lord, we did many wonderful works. We cast out demons in your name and we preached in your name. Oh, Lord, we've done so many wonderful works. And he says, I never knew you, depart from me. I'm only pointing out one thing. People who believe the gospel in vain are seldom aware of it. But you know tonight whether the gospel is ever good news to you or not, don't you? I know whether it was good news to me or not. You know as much as I know. Was it good news to you? Or did it just sound like the right uh, theological scheme to you? And you said it's as good as that. That's believing in vain. Or does it just sound reasonable to you? The gospel never sounds reasonable. The gospel is the most unreasonable thing in the world. Man can't be saved because the gospel is reasonable to him. He says, oh, that sounds right. I'll believe that way. Men believe in vain who only have a head knowledge of the gospel of Christ. When a man believes with a heart, it's good news. You know whether it's good news or not to you. Has it been good news to you? There's further proof. Now I want you to note carefully what Paul says, verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. Now, if you believed in vain, you will not be able to keep in memory the gospel that was preached to you. Think that over. I preach four times a week. That's just regular. I have stations in between, then I don't count. Now that figures up to about 200 and some hour-long messages a year, plus all the extra preaching that I don't count as uh, regular. But I never one time in preparing to preach have to sit down and get my story straight. And I never one time have to look up in a book and say, how was it now that the gospel went? Something about Jesus. I just can't keep in memory. I, I, and I was playing there last week when I was given it, but I can't see it now. Well, do you realize that we've got a multitude of professing Christians who are just like that? They can't remember from one Sunday to another how the gospel goes? And do you know that if you ask them seven times a week, that is once a day, to give you the gospel in the simplest terms they could give it to you, they give it to you seven different ways? 
They'd tell you today to join the church, and they'd tell you tomorrow to live a good life, and they'd tell you the next day, have you been baptized? And the next day they'd say we ought to take communion. The next day they'd say we ought to be moral and, and hold out faithful to the end. They'd be telling you seven different things a week because they just simply can't keep in memory the gospel that was preached to them. For they have believed without effect, in vain. And Paul says the proof of vain faith, the proof of a head knowledge only of the gospel is that you will not be able to keep in memory the gospel that was preached to you, and the correction in your margin says you will not be able to hold fast the word which I announced unto you as glad tidings. Now, these people have been infiltrated by false preachers. Hymenius and Alexander came preaching false doctrine, and some of the professing Christians in Corinth were swept away by that false doctrine. <coughs> now, let me restate what I'm trying to say. How does a man know whether he has believed in his heart or with his head? He knows, first of all, he knows he has truly believed in his heart because the gospel is good news. Secondly, he knows it because without any effort on his part, without working at it on his part, he is enabled day after day, week after week, month after month, and year upon year to hold fast the word which he received from Christ. No Hymenius and Alexander ever converted He's never proselyted to Catholicism or Judaism or Zoroasterism or anything else. He's never taken aside by the false shepherds and the false prophets and converted to another gospel. He holds fast in his soul that word which was first revealed to him by the Holy Spirit as the good news of the cross. No saved man ever changes his mind, his opinions, or his heart about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. True? Yes. Oh, they can argue, they can fuss, and they can ask you hard questions you can't answer. They can give you logical and reasonable reasons why you should not believe what you believe, but you cannot help yourself. You hold on to it because in your soul you know it is the gospel of Christ and can't help yourself. Times when everything in your head says it's all wrong, you should believe something else. But your heart says, this is the gospel that saved my soul. This is the gospel that was good news to me when I was lost. This is the only gospel that gives peace. And the believer holds fast the word of God and nothing shakes him loose. Now, I've been shaken considerably. I've been shaken by family and I've been shaken by friends. I've been shaken by enemies and foes and false brethren. I've been shaken by every kind of a theological scheme that could be sprung upon a man. I've had people work on me with diligence to convert me. They say I'm stubborn. They say you can't tell him anything. And they are correct. <laughs> there ain't nobody, no how, no time, no way ever going to tell me anything about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the day that I have to stand here and tell you, well, dear friends, I hate to confess this to you, but you know the gospel I've been preaching to you all these years is wrong. I just found it out today. <laughs> the day I tell you that, that will be the day I will confess to you that I was never saved at all. But when a man knows the gospel, Paul says at the beginning of our text, he has an absolute knowledge of it. Now, I don't apologize for that. Now, the world has another term for that. They call it bullheadedness. They think it is a sign and a mark of ignorance. Now, listen to this. They think it is a mark of ignorance when a man refuses to open his mind on a subject. They say, well, he's ignorant, you see. His mind's closed. To me, it is a mark of ignorance for a man to say, I'm not sure what I do believe. It is evident to me he is ignorant of the truth. For if he knew the truth, he'd know what he believed. Now, I happen to know whom I have believed. And Paul knew who he believed. 
Do you know who you believe? And I'm persuaded. And incidentally, in the Greek, Paul uses the word when he said that. It means this. I, my mind is made up. I am wholly in my heart persuaded and nothing can change my mind that he's able to keep what I've committed unto him against that day. How do you know you believe with all eyes? You know it because you hold fast the word and nobody or no thing can shake you loose from it. Everybody going to convert a believer. Think of Clarence Mombercat. Are you there, Clarence? Listening to this tape? Think of Clarence. <coughs> 22 years old, had never seen a Protestant Bible, had never heard the gospel, couldn't even speak a word of English, raised a French Roman Catholic, raised to love the church and be obedient to it, living in the home of a priest, hoping that some of the goodness of the priest would rub off on him and deliver him from his sins and save his soul. The Roman Catholic Church all this time, while Clarence Mombercat languishes in his darkness, are going around the world saying, Give us a child until he's six years old, and no one will ever convert him or take him away from the Catholic Church. And let me tell you something. He sat down on a pine bench in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and somebody announced the good news to him, and Roman Catholicism run out of him like water out of a bathtub when you pull the plug. He couldn't remember the next day how to spell Catholic let alone what they taught, what they preached, or what had been drilled into him for 22 years. And let me tell you that since that time, for going on 30 years, they've hammered on little Clarence Mombercat day in and day out. His family, his friends, the priests, the church, the powers, the authorities that be, and he still day in and day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, holds fast the gospel that was delivered to him. Yeah. How does he do it? He doesn't do it at all. <laughs> it's just that nothing can be done with a believer. That's all. Nothing can be done. Now this is the reason I get a little disturbed when the religious world around me today gets big tears in their eyes about their young people having to go to worldly high schools and colleges because they'll, they'll just make infidels out of them. They surely will. It will bring the infidel out of them that's already in them. But you can hang a believer over hell by his heel. And as I told you before, he may get warmer. But his warmth will only increase his fervor for the gospel. <laughs> and he will be more sure than ever before that the things he believed are so. Every one of you believers know that I'm telling the truth tonight, don't you? This has nothing to do with our personal ups and downs, disappointments and frustrations in the Christian life. This has to do with something that was settled in our soul a long time ago. We have believed God's gospel to be good news for us, and nothing's going to change that in our hearts. And Paul says, now if you've believed in vain, you'll not be able to hold fast the word. Somebody shakes you loose from it before long. I've seen them drop off like ticks off a dog. Haven't you? You want to tick his dog. You don't want to bring up any unpleasant subject. Get on dog and get about as big around as a big pea. These blood suckers. They don't last long. They drop off after a while, don't they? Well, we get them every now and then. They soak up the gospel and they get the biggest ticks. They get the wax and eloquent about how much they know. Bible toters and Bible quoters. And they get fatter and ticks on the gospel, don't they? And slick. Then one day they just wither up and bust. And they can't keep in memory what they learned. And they can't remember. We saw it when we left the church business. In case you don't know what I'm trying to say. <coughs> we saw some that was fat as ticks on the gospel. And 30 days after we left the church business, they couldn't remember how the gospel went. Isn't that so? 
And in 30 days, they had invented a new gospel. And they couldn't keep in memory the word that was delivered unto them. Have you people had any trouble keeping it in memory? And if I drop dead tomorrow, we'll have nothing to do with your ability to keep in memory the gospel you've learned. You didn't learn it like Paul of man, if you learned it at all. If you learned it at all, you learned it from Christ. You may have learned it through a man, but you learned it from Christ, as every man learns it. I'm not afraid about my children going out in the world, not any more than I'm afraid of myself going out in the world. I, my only concern is that my children are saved. I'm sure my children, if I'm sure my children are saved, they can go anywhere in this world and they will hold fast that gospel they have believed. There is another proof. Let me give it to you as I close this message. Listen. Wherein, verse 1 says, you stand. The word stand means to hold your ground. It is the opposite of retreating. It is the opposite of falling. It is what the religious world calls holding out faithful to the end. And Paul says that when men receive the gospel and are saved and believe with true heart knowledge and true absolute knowledge in the gospel, they stand. They hold their ground. They don't retreat. They don't fall from grace. They do hold out faithful to the end. Amen. The greatest lie being told today is that if we hold out faithful, if we stand, if we do not fall, if we do not retreat, if we keep in memory, if we can keep holding on to the truth, we will be saved because we hold on and do not fall. The Bible doesn't teach that any place. It teaches that if you are saved, you will not fall. It teaches that you will stand and you will hold fast to the Lord. You want to hear the great illustration of it? Corinthians. I'll tell you about these people. Then I'm going to quit tonight. I'm not going to preach on the tape of tonight. Let me tell you about these Christians. Pagan, heathen, idol worshippers, their main doctrine before Paul came to them was free love. They were immoral, corrupt, vile, filthy people. And Paul came down into that town preaching. And to some of those Corinthians it was good news. And they believed the gospel and were saved. And the Corinthian assembly was saved. They had been the object of every attack Satan could muster up against them. Number one, division. No sooner that our assembly got him on his feet and men came in and began to preach and the devil divided that assembly about four different ways. A little group gathered over and said, uh, we believe in Peter. A little group got over here and said, we believe in Paul. A little group over here said, we believe in Apollos. Another little group said, we believe in Christ. Divisions all the church four different ways. Immorality invaded the assembly. A man living in fornication openly and linking his testimony to the testimony of that assembly. False prophets came in and preached that the resurrection was already past and they had missed it. Judaizers came and run down the apostle Paul and said the man that preached the gospel to them. Their own spiritual father was a liar and a false prophet, false prophet and a false apostle. On top of that, they had nothing but disorder at the Lord's table. Lying ministers of Satan came in and preached, Paul says, another Jesus and another gospel by another spirit to them. They were racked and shocked by temptation among them. In fact, they had been hit with everything that Christians could be hit with. And still, <laughs> they stood their ground. Paul says, wherein ye stand. They had never retreated one inch from the gospel. They had never turned back. Oh, they were confused and they were mixed up and their assembly was in disorder and they needed help. But it was still clear to them 
that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. There are three ways to know that we have believed with the heart. One, we know that the gospel has been good news. Two, it is no effort to hold fast the word of that good news. And three, we stand. We stand. We wobble, but we stand. We tremble, but we stand. We are weak, but we stand. We hold our ground, we do not retreat. This correspondence is on my mind. I read through it today. It's like going back and reading a diary of times you don't want to remember. As I was reading through this correspondence, several dozen pages that I exchanged with some men in northern United States on the subject of the gospel, and I saw running through all of that exchange of correspondence this one thing, that if I would have given just a little ground on the substitutionary atonement, they would have welcomed me to their fellowship as their beloved brother and given me the esteem that they wanted to give me. And I couldn't give that little bit of ground. I couldn't do it. Call me stubborn, call me bullheaded, but I couldn't give that ground. I couldn't give it because it wasn't mine to give. And I couldn't alter the fact they hated that Christ was a true substitute for me. Can't alter that fact. I won't alter it. I won't alter it for any man alive. I can't alter it because it isn't mine to change. I don't know how I stood, but I'm still standing. And like the Corinthians, weak, wobbly, tired, weary, and there's many times when I'm sure I won't be able to stand, but I do, and you do, and we all do because we can't help ourselves. The gospel is good news. We cannot help but hold it fast because it's the only good news there is. And we cannot change it, nor can we retreat or give up the ground we occupy tonight. It is as simple as that. Christ died for me, my sin, buried for me and raised again the third day. And if I die tonight, I die singing what we sung Sunday night. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my right, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, lest we leave the impression that we stand because we are strong, Paul, in the closing verses of this passage I read tonight, said, I labored more abundantly than all of them. And then he said, but not I but the grace of God that was in me. And I am what I am by the grace of God. Paul realized that this determination to stand that couldn't be changed, this holding fast to the gospel which had never wavered down through his experience, this power of the gospel to bring good news to his heart had nothing to do with him. It was the grace of God working in him. And it is the grace of God in every believer and in us tonight. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this time tonight. Thank you for this blessed privilege of preaching again this good news. And, oh, Father, how glad we are that you brought these to this building tonight. Oh, we just thank you that you brought these precious souls here tonight to hear thy word. Apply this word now to our hearts and lives. Send us away who are truly believers in a new assurance that the gospel is good news, that we do hold it fast in our hearts, and that we do stand. And we have stood all these years. Help us to look back, that we might look on and sing, "Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Thank you again for this meeting. And thank you especially, Father, for bringing Bob home tonight, for bringing Alan home and bringing Herbie and bringing us all together in this precious time of fellowship.
and joy. We give you all the praise and all the thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Lord bless you.